In 79 AD, at the height of the Roman Empire, a great cataclysm struck the Italian peninsula. The mountain of Vesuvius, near present-day Naples, erupted, killing thousands and destroying the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum. The only surviving account of the event comes from two letters by a Roman magistrate named Pliny the Younger to the historian Tacitus. These letters described exactly what happened in the days before and during the eruption. It was the first time in history a detailed account of such an eruption had been given. Explosive volcanic eruptions like Vesuvius are now known as Plinian eruptions. The Romans did not realize that this was a volcano. They knew about volcanoes because Etna had erupted many times in Roman history, but they didn't know about Vesuvius. And in less than 24 hours, the city of Pompeii was buried under many meters of volcanic ash, and the city of Herculaneum was swept away by pyroclastic flows. The explosion was about the size of the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. And Mount St. Helens, we calculate, had an energy release the equivalent of 24 megatons. Bear in mind, in the case of both Mount St. Helens and Vesuvius, that would be 24 megatons of energy released over a period of about 24 hours as opposed to a nanosecond with a hydrogen bomb. When the eruption of Vesuvius began in AD 79, it created a cloud of volcanic ash that rose at least 50,000 feet into the atmosphere. The prevailing winds carried this to the southeast, and this dropped a large blanket of volcanic ash on the city of Pompeii over a period of about 18 hours. We know that about 1,000 people died in the city. As volcanic ash started to pile up, it placed a great deal of weight on the rooftops of the houses, and eventually the, the roofs collapsed, burying the people underneath. Pompeii was basically buried under more than 30 feet of volcanic ash. The city disappeared. As bad as the ash cloud that destroyed Pompeii was, it was only the beginning. As the people in the nearby city of Herculaneum would soon find out, as this volcanic ash cloud continued to erupt for hours, eventually it got to the point that the eruption could no longer propel the ash high into the atmosphere, and the cloud collapsed, producing pyroclastic flows. And these pyroclastic flows were mixtures of extremely hot gas and volcanic ash with temperatures on the order of 500 or 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, Herculaneum was better positioned initially because the prevailing winds carried the volcanic ash cloud away from Herculaneum. But Herculaneum was subsequently buried by these pyroclastic flows. So it's a very different story for them. In Herculaneum, the kind of preservation is different. Imagine concrete coming at you at temperatures of 500 to 600 degrees, incinerating everything but subsequently preserving everything beautifully. In Pompeii, on the other hand, the people were encased in much more porous volcanic ash, and over the centuries, their corpses decayed, their bones were dissolved, and what we were left with were casts without any preservation of the people. In many respects, Herculaneum is better preserved, but it is much harder to excavate because of the difference between the styles of eruption that covered them. It is estimated as many as 16,000 people died in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. Part of the reason for such a tragically high number was the volcano itself. Although the Romans did not know that Vesuvius was an active volcano, they were well acquainted with the benefits that active volcanoes provide. There was rich agriculture on the flanks of the volcano. In fact, Pompeii and the region were famous for the wine that was produced. There was also deposits that the Romans discovered that we now today called pozzolan. It's volcanic ash that when mixed with lime produces a concrete that will set underwater. This is one of the great discoveries of the Romans. The abundance of fertile ground and other resources around Vesuvius has led to a dense and ever-increasing population around the volcano. And although Vesuvius has not repeated an eruption on the scale of devastation and loss of life as the 79 AD explosion, it is far from quiet. Vesuvius remains quite active. Since AD 79, Vesuvius has erupted about 36 times. 
most recently in 1944. With a large population living around Vesuvius, the Italian authorities are very concerned about the status of the volcano. However, there's much more volcanic activity in the area, and the threat extends far beyond just Vesuvius. The greatest concentration of people in the surrounding area is in the city of Naples, locally known as Napoli. Napoli is probably one of the most important places in the world for studying active volcanism. More than three million people are threatened by possible eruptions from Mount Vesuvius and another volcanic center that few people outside of Italy know about named Campi Flegre. Campi Flegre is Italy's supervolcano. You can think of it as Italy's Yellowstone. It's about 12 kilometers in diameter. That's much smaller than Yellowstone, but on the other hand, it's much more active and more threatening. We call these supervolcanoes calderas because what they are is big basins. The eruption is so big that no edifice is produced. The explosions erupt anywhere from 300 cubic kilometers to more than 1,000 cubic kilometers of material. And what you're left with is a big basin that we call a caldera. Capi Flegre has produced several very large eruptions. One that we know about occurred 30,000 years ago, released 300 cubic kilometers of volcanic ash. About 15,000 years ago, a major eruption released between 30 and 50 cubic kilometers of volcanic ash that we call the Neapolitan Tuff. That would be 30 to 50 times the eruption of Mount St. Helens. The Neapolitan Tuff is widely distributed around the Bay of Naples. It forms yellow cliffs, and it's used in building stone a lot in the city of Napoli today. In Campi Flegre, the ground moves dramatically because magma is injected continuously at depth, causing the ground to rise, and then the ground will subside as the magma cools and shrinks. The earthquake activity is extreme. Probably a third of the population of Napoli lives actually inside the caldera itself. So the risk posed by an eruption from Campi Flegre is to not just the city of Napoli, but really southern Italy as a whole. The long occupation of the area around Vesuvius and Campi Flegre has meant many generations of people have been living under threat. But it's also provided scientists with an unusual window into the study of its volcanic history. Campi Flegre is one of the first places where scientists were able to recognize and document significant uplift and subsidence of the Earth's crust. They could do this because in the Bay of Pozzuoli there are Roman columns that have been burrowed into by mollusks. The Romans didn't build the temples in the ocean, they built them on dry land. So that dry land above sea level had to subside so that sea level came up and then those mollusks could burrow in there and then the land had to rise up again. When the land would subside, the columns would drop down beneath sea level, mollusks would burrow into them, and then when magma intruded at depth and the surface of the earth was pushed up again, these columns would be emergent and the mollusks would die. This is all since the Romans. This is a couple of thousand years. And so we can see those mollusks today and track over centuries the rise and fall of Pozzuoli Bay uh, as a result of the restlessness of the Campi Flegre caldera. If you have these columns that were raised up and lowered down within the span of time of a couple of thousand years, imagine multiplying that by earth time and you can then imagine how mountains form, valleys form, oceans form. It was very enlightening. The contributions of Campi Flegre have not been only to science. Over the centuries, other disciplines have been influenced by its unique nature. So Campi Flegre is also host to a very active geothermal system. One of these that is quite renowned is Solfaterra. This is something that has been known and described since the time of Dante. In fact, it's thought to be the inspiration for the entrance to hell. These hydrothermal systems are produced by groundwater circulating down to depth 
where it becomes heated by the heat released from the magma beneath Capi Flegre. Once it's heated, it comes back up toward the surface and is released as superheated steam. You can imagine hot gaseous emissions coming out of the ground above the boiling point of water and reeking of sulfur. This is exactly the sort of thing that Dante would imagine going into hell, and this is what you have at Solfaterra. The intense energies contained under Vesuvius and Campi Flegre have led many in the past to make wild speculations about their nature and causes. But today, scientists have a much firmer understanding of what's actually going on under the ground. At the Monitoring Center for the Italian National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology in Naples, the entire area is watched 24 hours a day. Vesuvius itself has 18 seismic monitoring stations and seven infrasound microphones working around the clock. It is the most sophisticated and accurate geophysical monitoring system in the world. Today, we don't have to look at the columns of ancient Roman ruins to measure how the earth is responding to the volcanic forces that are acting on it. Now you can measure how fast the surface is rising, what the heat flow is. You can measure those things directly. We can actually see and in a sense feel the earth rise as it rises and as it falls and as the heat flows through it. Despite all the advanced hardware and data being collected at this and other monitoring stations, volcanoes can still be wildly unpredictable. Volcanologists would still benefit from a closer look at the interior of an actual volcanic system. Coincidentally, such an opportunity presented itself a relatively short distance away. Dr. Jim Quick is a volcanologist at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. For 16 years, he spent summers studying the geology of a mountainous region called Valsasia in northern Italy. In 2009, he released his findings on an extraordinary discovery. The Valsasia area of northern Italy sits in the foothills of the Alps. It's a very special place because of the collision that occurred between Europe and Africa. It's the collision that produced the mountains we call the Alps. When continents collide, it's a slow motion event that takes place over tens of millions of years, but the results can be quite dramatic. Now in the case of northern Italy and the Valsasia area, we actually have the boundary between Africa and Europe exposed there. It's called the Insubric Line. This collision would be occurring against Africa and Europe, and as a result of that collision along the Insubric Line, the crust of the African plate is tilted and bringing up progressively deeper and deeper rocks as you approach the Insubric Line. Now, of course, at the same time, erosion is occurring. You're building mountains, but you're also wearing them down through erosive processes. And so what we see now today cuts through the original crust that had been tilted and uplifted. What makes it even more special is at the very top of this tilted section of rocks, we have a caldera, a super volcano, something the equivalent or similar to a, a Campi Flegre or a Yellowstone, but much older. This caldera is about 285 million years in age, and we know that that's when it formed because we can date the rocks using the decay of uranium to produce lead. Everybody is familiar that uranium is radioactive. And when it does decay, it produces a certain specific isotope of lead. Looking at the ratios of these isotopes, we can calculate the age of the minerals that host them. So we know that this system was active at about 285 million years ago. And beneath it, is a magmatic system exposed by this tilting as well. It's the only place in the world where such exposures exist. What's particularly interesting about this is what you can see in the field when you look at the rocks. It's what the geophysicists imagine exists at depth beneath Yellowstone, beneath Campi Flegre, when they look at their seismic data. They see a magma chamber perched at a depth of about four or five kilometers that's feeding the eruption. And then beneath that is a much deeper, larger volume of magmatic rocks that's providing the heat that drives the whole system. This is at a depth of more than 20 kilometers. 
And in Valsasia, we see this whole section beautifully displayed, and we can look at the relationship of these rocks and gain a better understanding of how these systems work. You're actually walking through the depths of the crust of the earth and actually seeing the kinds of minerals and rocks that are formed from each composition of magma and each temperature and pressure. And that's an amazing thing to see. It's like walking down towards the center of the earth. Dr. Quick's discovery provides a first-hand look at the deep interior plumbing of a supervolcano. It will further research on the prediction of volcanic events, not only at Vesuvius and Campi Flegrei, but other geophysical hotspots around the world. It may also help in discovering ways to channel these volcanic forces more effectively toward human consumption. Such an endeavor is already underway and has been for many years, again in Italy, in a place called Lardarello. The Lardarello area of Italy is interesting geologically because of the large hydrothermal systems that are there. Lardarello really got started being exploited to produce boric acid, a product that you can produce from volcanic muds. But with time, it was realized that these systems produced steam that had enough energy that you could drive turbines and generate electricity. In 1911, the first geothermal plant in the world was produced in Lardarello using that technology. And that plant is still active today. The Lardarello geothermal complex powers more than 30 power plants generating more than 700 megawatts of electricity, which is a significant contribution to the power grid of Italy. There in Italy is the first place it was done. And if you look now, it's all over the world. Everywhere there's high heat flow, there is someone trying to take advantage of the hot springs to use the energy of the earth to produce electricity. Since Pliny the Younger sent his letters to Tacitus, people have sought to understand the immense forces behind the eruption of Vesuvius. Why did it erupt? When will it erupt again? The monitoring of activity at Vesuvius and Campi Flegre is allowing scientists to see in real time the ever-changing nature of a living volcanic system. Dr. Quick's discovery of the caldera at Valsasia is giving scientists an understanding of a supervolcano to depths previously thought impossible. The Lardarello complex is allowing geophysicists to capture a portion of this energy for public use. It is hoped that the amassing of all this data will not only help volcanologists detect and predict the next eruption of Vesuvius, it could help in understanding the behavior of other volcanoes around the world. It could also assist geophysicists in finding new and better ways to harness this fantastic resource for the benefit of everyone. As humans, we need to understand the Earth, how its plumbing works, how its heat is distributed and what it does, how we can make life better by using the resources of the earth in a responsible way. We must understand the earth so that people can have a better life.